I'm Robert Dykroff. I'm the director and Levy professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. I grew up in a small suburb of Rotterdam. My dad worked in the port of Rotterdam, which was kind of exotic because, you know, these big ocean liners, they would come from all over the world. I uh, had to give a presentation for English classes and I bought a Scientific American. And I read the Scientific American, I was I think, 15. And I noticed I could actually understand these articles. I still know on the cover was an article about quark confinement, but I then would work on 30 years later. And I was so fascinated, and I went back to the library and started to read all the volumes back, all the way to the 1940s. I remember when I was a young boy, I would love to read about stuff, but I always would immediately start making drawings and giving presentations. Because it's one thing to learn about, you know, electrons in an atom. But the shapes of these wave functions is so beautiful. I wanted to draw them, you know, somehow get my hands on it. If I think about a research project, it's almost like you have these kind of um, these intelligence tests where you take a certain object and you have to rotate it in your mind. Basically, you have to walk around it. And sometimes I literally feel I'm walking around my problem and looking at it at various angles. So there's, a, I think, a very visual style of thinking with a little bit this affliction called synesthesia which means that all numbers have colors a pi is brown similar to the p but it's slightly different so i like to joke you know you know the colors until the third decimal but then there are other people they think much more in terms of algorithms they want to think in terms of some logical sequence i'm not a very logical sequence thinker person so i think it's very important that you uh, allow your your personal toolbox to be filled and try these different approaches. So I think that visualization and thinking in terms of images is for me a very powerful way also to approach science. So it's very natural to combine the two. So I applied to art school. I was very proud to get in. Uh, but when I was in art school, I certainly felt liberated to read physics books again, like I did when I taught myself in high school. And certainly I realized, wait a moment, and uh, then I uh, reversed course and went back to, to, to physics. But sometimes I say, actually, what looked like a, a detour for me was almost like a shortcut. Because when I came back to physics, I kind of uh, took with me the lessons I learned in art school, which was not about passing a test. It was all about exploring. If you are in some way are fascinated by a small detail, by a little element that you don't understand, that actually might be the beginning of something great. I think now we are in the moment where we cannot only understand how things around us are built up out of these building blocks, but we have the tools, we have the technological power to start manipulating the building blocks and start building. We are entering the age where through genetic engineering and more and more refined ways to genetic engineer, get CRISPR-Cas9 wave prime editing, we can redesign things. So I can imagine that in 100 years, people look back to our times and say, wait a moment, this was the beginning of this huge wave where we start to literally build the world atom by atom, bit by bit, gene by gene. Uh, because of this massive investment in basic research that we have done in the past hundred years to really understand the nature of reality. So in some sense, science is drifting away from society, the human gap between ordinary citizens and what's happening at the very, very frontier of research is increasing. So we have to think how to bridge that gap, make sure that you know, everybody understands something about it, at least understands the basic principles, and that the people who are developing these technologies are in a dialogue with the rest of society. Is that it's not only about understanding the science, but also understanding uh, what is the path that you can take from a interested non-expert to get there. So where are people? How do their lives look like? What is their frame of reference? And one of the lessons I learned, whenever you want to communicate, you shouldn't start uh, with the end point in mind. You should start with the beginning. If you start from that and then say, well, what do you have to do to move towards what's happening? There's always this wonderful challenge, you know, how to bring people 
towards this kind of source of fascination, which is, which is research.